Recent events have led to the belief that there's coming a major battle somewhere in the vicinity of where I'm standing. In fact, this entire area one day will be covered with troops. It will be covered with armies and soldiers in one of the biggest battles of biblical history called the Battle of Gog and Magog. I'm coming to you from the area of Bashan, which is in the northern part of Israel, also known as the Golan Heights, which will be a central area where this battle will be located. Before we get into the teaching of this battle, I want to take you into a special room in Jerusalem and show you 66 tablets of the prophet Ezekiel written on basalt stone and give you a brief summary of the discovery of those tablets and how they were brought into the country of Israel. We're in the house, uh, actually the, the area of the home of the second president of Israel, Ben Zvi, and we're in a very interesting place and that is the uh, place that houses what is called the Ezekiel tiles, the uh, 81 uh, tablets that are on basalt stone and that are directly in front of me here. And while Charlie shows you these, let me read what it says. These inscribed marble towers are reputed to have come from the traditional tomb of the prophet Ezekiel in Kafar al-Kafil on the Euphrates River in Iraq. They have not yet been dated precisely, but many scholars have suggested the 10th century at the earliest. The tomb of Ezekiel is first mentioned in the Igaret Rav Sharia Goan in the year 987 and is described in detail in the accounts of Jewish travelers in the Middle Ages. Considered a holy place until recent years, Jews visited the tombs on pilgrimages, particularly on the holidays of Shavuot, which is Pentecost. The story of the acquisition of the Ezekiel tiles extends over a period of some 40 years. During World War II, David HaKohen was in charge of Sol Benah building operations in the countries of Syria and Lebanon. His interest in the history of the Middle East led him to purchase local antiquities. A Lebanese engineer told him of the existence of a set of marble tiles on which chapters from the book of Ezekiel were engraved in relief Hebrew script. The tiles were in the possession of a woman who had acquired them from her father-in-law, a collector of antiquities. The woman refused to sell the tiles, but several years later she contacted David HaKohen and said, these tiles must be in the land of Israel. HaKohen purchased the tiles in 1947 through the uh, intermediary of a family in Beirut who paid two pounds sterling for them and stored them for safe keep keeping. Only in 1953 was it possible to transfer the tiles from Lebanon to Israel through the good auspices of Archbishop Georges Hakim, the Greek uh, Catholic Patriarch. All the tiles with two exceptions, were given to Yitzhak ben Zvi, the second president of Israel, and a noted historian of the land of Israel. After his death, they became the property of Yad Yitzhak ben Zvi, which is where we are now, the, the home and the area where he lived. Uh, the interesting thing about these tiles are that the, the letters themselves are raised letters. They're not carved into the tablets, but they're actually raised letters. And uh, the, the other point that's interesting, if you look at them carefully, is they do not contain, of course, the dots that make up the vowel lettering of modern Hebrew. And um, this particular uh, type of script uh, the, uh, that you see on the tablets is very similar to some of the modern Hebrew that is used today that came into existence after around, let's say, the 6th century or so. Uh, from like the 5th and 6th century before, the uh, Hebrew script, the styling of the letters was different than this right here. And so this is somewhat different. This is a different type of script from the earlier script that would have been used back, let's say, in the Roman period or whatever. And this is more of the, uh, uh, what we call the modern Hebrew script. So these are the tiles, or what they call the tablets or the tiles of Ezekiel here in this beautiful uh, uh, surrounding uh, back home in the land of Israel. One of the greatest prophets of the Bible was, was without a doubt the prophet Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel was a priest, he along with Jeremiah. He was taken into Babylonian captivity and one day while down at the, one of the great rivers of that area, he experienced a vision from God. In fact, the entire book of Ezekiel is a series of prophecies and visions by this great, great, wonderful Old Testament prophet. He was the first man to see cherubim carrying the throne of God. The Jewish people call this the Merkabah, when God's throne becomes a chariot. And from chapter 1 all the way through, this great prophet, you can actually divide his book up into several different sections. As a matter of fact, let's look at that right now. He talks about Israel's captivity in chapter 1 through chapter 24, and he gives Israel the reason why they went into captivity. Then in Ezekiel chapters 25 through chapter 32, he begins to deal with the judgment of the nations who come against Israel. What will happen to them? Their judgment for mistreating God's people. 
And then in the book of Ezekiel chapters 33 through 39, he deals with Israel in the last days prior to the return of their Messiah. And then chapters 40 through 48 are extremely fascinating because they deal with what's called the Millennial Temple, the temple that will be built one day in Jerusalem at the return of the Lord during the 1,000-year reign of Christ. Now, what we want to key up on today is chapters 35 all the way through to chapters 48. And we're going to divide that up into four sections. We're going to be dealing with the dividing of the land of Israel, which I believe is in the process of taking place even now while we speak and will in the near future. Then we're going to be talking about how that the Jews survived the Holocaust, which is the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. Then we're going to be talking about the famous War of Gog and Magog, which is Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. And we're going to conclude in Jerusalem talking about the millennial reign or the temple that's going to be built there one day. Now the first place that we have to begin when we talk about the nation of Israel is talk about Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel 37 is a vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. Those who have survived the Holocaust, and I'm speaking of Jewish people, believe that that prophecy is a prophecy concerning that particular time of world history and how that God brought them out. Ezekiel chapter 37, the prophet is set down in a valley of bones that are dry. They're separated. There's skull bones in one section, back bones in another section, leg bones in another section. And God asked the prophet one question. He says, prophet, can these bones live? Can they live again? And the prophet answers God and says, God, only you know. Now, here's what the scripture tells us in Ezekiel chapter 37. Prophesy to these bones and say to them, you will live. Chapter 37, verse 5. God said, I will bring sinews and flesh, cover you with skin and put breath in you. Chapter 37, verse 6. God said there would be a noise and a shaking and a coming together bone to bone. Verses 7 and 8. God said he, he told the prophet to speak to the wind and the four winds blew and suddenly life came back to them. Now the four winds always alludes to the north and the south and the east and the west or it alludes, it alludes to a regathering of the Jewish people. Now when you read Ezekiel 37 and 10, this is an important verse. It says this. So I prophesied as he commanded, and, he, and, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. It predicts here that Israel will return to the land after being divided and separated, after they look like their skeletons and become a great and mighty army in the land of Israel. It specifically tells you it would be called Israel in Ezekiel chapter 37. Chapter verse. Uh, Chapter 37, verse 12 says, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold my people, I will open up your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And again, a grave is symbolic of death. Now when you go back through history and you look at the Holocaust pictures, these people literally, so many thousands of them, were starved. And when they were found and when they were brought back into the country, they literally were skeletons with skin over top of their body. People said, how can these people survive? How can they even live in the land where they're headed? When they got off the ship, the British even attempted to stop one of the ships full of Holocaust victims from coming in. But God somehow supernaturally moved and began to restore them back again. Now, when you look at Ezekiel chapter 37, it plainly says they're going to be called Israel, and it also tells you that they are going to become a great army. Now listen to this verse of Scripture in Ezekiel chapter 37, 19. Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. It's often pointed out that in this particular prophecy, how that the tribes were divided. You know, there was a northern, northern tribes and there was the southern tribes and they were, there was a, a separation. You know, the ten tribes disappeared in the time of the Assyrians. But how God would bring them all back as one. Now, when you come to Israel today, you don't hear people talk about, I'm of the tribe of Judah, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. You just say, we are Israel. And that's basically what the prophet said was going to happen in the last days. It's also interesting to note, only as a point of interest, that it talks about that the, the stick of Joseph in the hand of Ephraim would be put with the stick of Judah and they would be together. Now there are people who believe, and it's a controversial teaching, that Joseph and Ephraim, or what we say Ephraim and Manasseh, are a picture of America and Britain. Well, it's interesting that Britain and America are the only two nations on the face of the earth that stand with the nation of Israel. So there may be a cryptic allusion, if I can say it that way, to the future of how two nations would stand with Israel. And Britain and America are honestly the only two friends this nation has. The other nations predominantly are either anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, or they just don't like the Jewish people in general, or the nation of Israel in general. Now, so God brought them back. Now, here's what happens. You can't miss this point. 
After God brings the Hebrew people back to this land, there is a struggle that begins to ensue over dividing the land up. Now that struggle is pictured in Ezekiel chapters 35 and 36. Now this is where I personally believe we are at prophetic prophetically right now. The Holocaust has already happened. That's in the past. They're now a great army. They're in the land of Israel. That's chapter 37. But in chapter 35 and 36, the prophet begins to talk about a prophecy concerning Mount Seir. Now, if we go back and study, and I won't have time to do this on this particular teaching, but you can do this on your own. Edom, the area of Edom, is where Mount Seir is located. Now, who were the Edomites? The Edomites were the descendants of a man by the name of Esau. You know, there was Jacob and Esau that had a conflict with each other. Jacob took his brother's birthright and blessing. Esau hated him for it. And of course, that started a little bit of animosity between what we now know today as the Arab people and the Jewish people. But Mount Seir is located today in the country of Jordan. Now, when you begin to read a prophecy that's 2,500 years old, you have to ask yourself, who, who are they talking about here? Because some of the names that existed back in that day may be different than modern names today. Well, let me, let me say this to you, and I hope you trust me when I tell you this, because we did an in-depth research on Edom. We did an in-depth research on Esau. We did an in-depth research on Mount Seir. And basically, here's what you come up with today. The people who call themselves Palestinians, who live in the nation of Israel today, in what is called the West Bank, or what is called the Gaza Strip. Those individuals who classify themselves as Palestinians, being a Arab Christian or a Muslim, that lived in Israel prior to 1948. When you hear someone say, I'm a Palestinian, they basically are saying, our family lived here before the Jews lived here and before Israel became a nation. So those individuals who consider themselves Palestinians would actually be descendants of Esau, or they would be classified Mount Seir today. Now, the reason I'm saying that is when you start reading Ezekiel chapter 35 and 36, you start seeing a conflict develop that the prophet talks about, of how somebody from Mount Seir, the Edomites, if you please, are going to try to split the nation of Israel and make it two nations. Here's some of the verses that I want to read to you. First of all, God says, you've had a perpetual hatred against the children of Israel. You know, the conflict you see going on in Israel today between what is called the Jews and the Palestinians, it's really not a new conflict. It goes back all the way between Jacob and Esau and their descendants, two brothers that are wrestling for a piece of property. But let's read the scripture now. Here's what it says. Because you have said, and this is Mount Seir or Edom, because you have said, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine and we will possess it whereas the Lord was there. And it says, Son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, because the enemy has said, Aha, the ancient high places are ours for a possession. Ezekiel 36, 1 and 2. Now let's put this together because what they're saying here is this. They're saying there is a nation called Israel. But we're going to divide that nation up into two parts. We're going to give them one part. We're going to take another part. And then they say, watch this, these two nations will be ours. Wow. In other words, after we get what we want, we're going to go after them and we're going to own both of them. And that's really the rhetoric that you hear from some of the more fanatical people that are descendants of Esau, even in this country. Now, here's what else is interesting. Notice what it says. Ah, even the ancient high places are ours for a possession. Do you know where the ancient high places are? The ancient high places, according to the biblical term, is the area called Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria today is known as the West Bank. And the West Bank is the area that's very controversial right now, where many of the Palestinians live, that Israel annexed it in right after the 1967 war. It used to be the country of Jordan, but Israel annexed all that property in, and the Jordan River today becomes a dividing line between the country of Jordan, or ancient Mount Seir, if I can say it that way, and the country of Israel. And the West Bank is that controversial area where Ramallah, Nabulus and Hebron and some of those cities are, and that's the second territory they're fighting over. They're fighting over Gaza, which really doesn't have a lot of biblical connotation to it, except the fact the ancient Philistines lived there. But the West Bank is biblical history. It's the ancient high places. And this is where, according to the prophecy, that the real battle is going to take place. This is where the real conflict is going to come down. It has to do over the area of ancient Judea and Samaria. Now, this gets more interesting the deeper you go into it. Now, watch this verse here. Ezekiel says, they have swallowed you up on every side. In other words, they're trying to take over the Gaza area. Then they want the West Bank area. Then they want 
you know, Syria wants the, the Golan Heights. So they're trying to take you over on every side that you might be a possession unto the residue of the heathen. In other words, and send you back to the Gentile nations where you came from. Send you out of Israel. This is what he's saying here. Now notice what happens. You are taken up. He's speaking to Israel here. You're taken up with the lips of talkers that are an infamy of the people. Watch this. Ezekiel says they've swallowed you on every side. And they say that you have devoured and bereaved the nations. What did they accuse the Jews of? Trouble. Every time you turn the news on, you see someone from Iran, someone from Iraq, Afghanistan, somebody speaking up in the Middle East. The Jews are the problems of the world. If it wasn't for the Jews, if it wasn't for the Zionists. So the prophet here says they're going to blame you for the trouble that the nations are having. And he says you're taken up with the lips of talkers. I looked up the word talkers and it means a forked tongue, tongue a babbler, or a slanderer. All right? The word infamy, that you're an infamy of the people, is defaming or an evil report. So in other words, they're constantly saying that the Jews are evil. They're constantly bringing an evil report about Israel in order to try to get the two nations that they want. Now, I don't know if you keep up with the news and you follow what's happening, but this is a real picture, ladies and gentlemen, of what's called the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And everything that you read about, this is very important, everything you read about in the book of Ezekiel about this war which is coming, this is important, don't you miss this, will stem from the Palestinian conflict. The war of Gog and Magog, the root of it will be what's called the Palestinian conflict. I'm telling you based on what I see, what I know, what I read in God's Word, this is where the real situation lies right now. Now, if we continue to go, we have to ask ourselves uh, about a battle which is going to happen. There will be a battle that I believe is going to be a result of a conflict which will arise involving Israel and the Palestinians. And this battle will be over the land of Israel, and it's called the Battle of Gog and Magog. This is Ezekiel chapters 38 and chapter 39. Now, here's the timing of this battle. Uh, look at this, and the producer will put this on the screen where you can see it. It will happen after many days. It will happen in the latter, latter days. It will happen when the land is brought back from the sword. It will happen when Israel dwells safely. It will happen when they dwell in a land of unwalled villages. It will happen when the, the Israel dwells where there are no walls, gates, or bars uh, in their cities. And it will happen when the people are dwelling safely or when they have some form of security. All of those passages indicate the following, that this battle will happen, number one, when Israel is restored as a nation, and they have been. Number two, when the Jewish people have security. Now, we're on a tour here with the tour group, and we can go anywhere we want to go. We eat wherever we want to eat haven't seen any difficulties, and the people of Israel are now dwelling in cities with unwalled villages. In other words, there's no bars, there's no walls up. You go into a city, you drive through, and so everything I'm sharing with you, in th this could not have happened in Ezekiel's day. In his day, all cities had walls around them. You couldn't come into the city without coming through the city gate. This is a last day prophecy. So now we see that we're, we're getting set up. The scene is being set for the battle. Now, let's get into some real interesting teaching here. Here's somebody in this battle by the name of Gog, G-O-G. -G. This is a mysterious person, and there's a lot that's been written. Who is Gog? In fact, I want to ask a couple questions here. The word Gog in the English Bible, G-O-G, -G, is mentioned two times, and it's Ezekiel 38.2 and 39.1, and he's called Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Now, who in the world is Gog? There's been a lot of speculation, so here's what we're going to answer. Who is Gog? What is meant by the phrase chief prince and where is the land of Magog? First of all, let's look at the word Gog. That's not the first place it appears in the Bible in the book of Ezekiel. It appears in 1 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 4 and it was that he was a descendant of Reuben and his name is called Gog. Now that's the only place he's mentioned in the Old Testament by uh, in the English translation of the Bible, with the exception of Ezekiel 38 and 39, he's mentioned nine times in those two chapters in relating to this war with Israel which is going to, which, which is going to take place. Now, there's one verse that puzzles scholars. It's, it's in chapter 38, I believe it's verse 17, where God says about Gog, Are you not the one I have told the prophets of old about? Well, you know, you start reading all over the Old Testament and you find nothing listed about this man. Now, that's a curiosity in itself. But let's go on and talk about this for just a moment. Who is Gog? 
Now, there was an ancient tribe, and uh, all of this ties in when you start studying the history of Ezekiel's day all the way to our present time. There was a group of men called the Scythians, and the Scythians, was, the Scythians were uh, a, a very, very um, vicious group of people. In fact, they got to a point one time where when they would kill a person, they would take the skull and drink from the skull. They would peel the skin of the person off, and they would uh, use the leather for covering. Uh, you know, you could just, I'm not going to try to gross you out, but... You you can do a study on these individuals and you'll discover that they were, uh, they rode horses, uh, they were masters of horse riding, in fact, and they also were master archers, master warriors, extreme warriors. And so it's real interesting that there was an ancient cuneiform tablet. A cuneiform tablet was a tablet that was not written on paper or papyrus, but it was written on stone. And it called the head, listen to this, the chief leader of the Scythians was called Ga'agi. Ga'agi, which is very similar to the word Gog. So keep that in mind because historically Ezekiel would have been very familiar with this group of people. Now let me go to a, another little uh, nugget here. Number two, the ancient Sumerian word. Sumeria, the ancient Sumerian language, language is one of the earliest languages in world history. That language was spoken in what we call today the land of Iraq, ancient Sumeria, Iraq towards Syria, that part of the world. There is a word 5,500 years ago called Gug, and it would be spelled in English G-U-G, -G, and it, it, it alludes to darkness, darkness. So there's a second clue to this idea of Gug or Gog. Let's go a step further and see what else we can find. We can discover that Gog is called, Gog is called in Ezekiel, a chief prince. Now that's, that's a clue. Let me explain to you why that's a clue. When you read the New Testament, you will discover the Bible mentions there's principalities and powers in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Satan's called the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2 verse 2. In the book of Daniel chapter 10, there is a prince of Persia and there is a prince of Grecia, which are strong, evil, demonic angels, demonic spirits that were ruling over Babylon. When you begin to look at what Gog is, he's called the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, that could mean that there will come a leader in the future from the northern country whose name will be Gog. I know people from Romania whose last name is Gog, G-O-G, -G, Gog. Lazar Gog is the man's name. So that is a name that could actually be a leader. Now, I'll tell you one thing. If in the north country a leader comes to power one day by the name of Gog, we better really keep our eyes open because that could be, that could be the fulfillment of it. However, when you study the scripture and you look at what the scripture is saying, it almost appears that Gog is not so much a man as Gog is a chief principality that rules Meshach and Tubal, that rules over the north country. We would say a principality spirit, a spirit of darkness, if you please. Now, having said that, let's look at something else. The Septuagint is the Old Testament written in the Greek language. And in the Septuagint translation of the Bible, I'm going to read to you a verse that's found in Numbers chapter 14, verse 9. There was a giants that one time used to roam this whole area. In fact, we're now, so you'll know where I'm standing, in the Golan Heights of Israel, also called the Bashan, according to the Old Testament. And up here on these ridges, you find these dolems. And they're two large stones that are put together and a huge stone placed on top. This is the area of Og, Og the king of Bashan. Og, did you understand? There's Gog and then there's Og, Og, O-G, the king of Bashan whose bed was about 18 feet long and 4 feet wide. And this is the area, land of the ancient giants. Now the Bible tells us that one of the fathers of the ancient giants was a man by the name of Anak, A-N-A-K. Now in the book of Numbers, here's what it says. Uh, he shall pour water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be exalted higher than Agog, and his kingdom, and his kingdom shall be exalted. So in other words, I'm reading that to tell you that in the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament translated to the Greek language, they translate uh, Agog there as the word Gog. They say Gog in that particular passage. Now here's another interesting passage from the Old Testament, also from the Sept Septuagint translation. Amos chapter 7 verse 1. Listen to this one. Thus, thus the Lord showed me, and behold a swarm of locusts were coming. And one of the devastating locusts locuses was Gog the king. It translates here the word Gog in the Septuagint translation of the Bible. It's going to be different in the English translation, but the Septuagint is the Old Testament translated to the Greek language. So what's interesting is two places in the Septuagint, the word Gog is mentioned. Now, I'm not going to go into the theological purposes or reasons why it was translated that way, but my point is, God said to Ezekiel, I have spoken in ancient time about him. 
So somewhere, something was known about this person called Gog. Now here's another reason why I personally believe that Gog is not a man, Gog is a principality. You ready for this? Because the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39 happens, I believe at least, before the tribulation period, the seven year tribulation period. Gog reappears in the latter part of the book of Revelation at the end of the 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth. He reappears, stirring up the people of Gog, Magog, Meshach, and, all, and you read it in the book of Revelation. In fact, I've got the verse here, let me just read it to you. And he reappears at a thousand years after the millennial reign of Christ. Watch this, here's the verse. He shall go forth to deceive the nations. Now this is when Satan is loosed from the pit at the end of the thousand years, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, battle the number of them who is the sand of the sea. And uh, of course they come up against the city of Jerusalem. The Bible said fire comes down from God out of heaven to devour them, Revelation 28 and 9. So how can Gog be a part of this battle, which is going to happen in the near future, and then how can he reappear at the end of the 1,000 year reign of Christ? If he's a man and he's killed in battle, and he's, he's a sinner, he's going to go into hell, and the only time he's going to come back is to stand before the great white throne judgment, then he's cast in the lake of fire. How does he reappear? If he's a spirit that's bound when Satan is bound, and then the Satan is released and those spirits are released, then it stands to reason Gog is not just a man. Gog is a prince spirit. He is the prince of darkness. He's a demonic spirit directly under Satan. Now, I personally believe that this Gog, who is the chief prince, that chief prince alludes there not just to a leader, an earthly leader. Of course, principalities work through personalities. Gog, the spirit, is going to have to work through a person, absolutely. But Gog may actually be some form of a demonic spirit. Now, let's talk about this. Look at the nations that are going to be involved in that great battle that day when it happens here. The Bible in the book of Ezekiel lists the nations, and there's, there's a a real clue that I'm going to tell you about that connects all these nations listed together. Watch this carefully. First is the nation of Persia. We know that that's Iran. It was called Persia until 1935. In fact, it was named Persia in, in the 9th century BC. They'll be involved. So the Iranians will be involved in this war. Number two, Ethiopia. The Hebrew word there is Kush. Kush, and that has reference not only to the area of Ethiopia in northern Africa, but it has reference in the ancient time to what is today called the Sudan. Oh my, you know about the Islamic fanaticism that's taking place in Sudan and how they are linked with some of the fanatical, uh, other fanatical Islamic countries. Isn't that interesting? So here we have a, another nation listed. Libya is listed. The Hebrew word is put, and that happens to be l the country of Libya in northern Africa. The country Gomer is mentioned in, as one of the nations that will attack Israel in this battle. And these are the Germanic tribes in various parts of Europe. In fact, uh, Gomer uh, ancient writings talk about Gomer. They call them the Gomerites. They were the ancient uh, uh, Cimmerians who were expelled about 700 BC from southern Turkey. The Babylonian Talmud talks about Gomer and, and it, it renders it as Germania or Germany and it was a, an area that was established between uh, two of the rivers in, there in Europe. So in other words it appears that Germany has some form of a link uh, when this battle begins to take place, or at least certain parts of that part of the world does. Now let's go a step further. It talks about the house of Tagarma. Now Tagarma in Ezekiel's day, there was a place called Cappadocia, which is in modern Turkey. And there was a city, this is interesting, that was known in Ezekiel's day in Turkey as Tagarma or Takarma, which is very similar to the word Tagarma, which is used here in the book of Ezekiel. So we understand that there will be parts of Turkey absolutely, that are also going to be involved in this, in this war all the way toward Armenia, southern part of Russia. I'll talk about that in a moment. Meshach and Tubal, many scholars trace that to Moscow and Tobolsk, which is located in Rus Russia. Others trace it to ancient cities which were located in the edge of eastern Turkey. So when we sum this up, here's the, here's the part that you've really got to catch. When we sum this up, every nation that was just listed, okay, if we could talk about Iran, if we talk about Libya, if we talk about Germania or the German tribes, if we talk about every country listed, do you understand that 50 years ago, all of those countries were pro-Western? That 50 years ago, Iran had a man, uh, a wonderful man who was like a monarch over that country that was pro-Western. Do you realize every country I've just named, Jewish people used to live there before 1948? Do you realize that every country I named have, has one common link? All those countries in Ezekiel 38 and 38 that will come against Israel and fight them have one link. They are now all Muslim. And certain parts of the world 
where these countries are listed are fanatical Muslims. And so here's what you really end up with. When you end up to where uh, in Ezekiel's day, when he was given this prophecy, and you go and study a map, you discover that the northern part of Africa, you will discover that the eastern part of Turkey, and yes, the southern part of Russia. Here's what's interesting about the southern part of Russia. The southern part of Russia has five states. Remember, Russia, Russia broke apart, right? Soviet Union broke apart, actually. And five states that are all Islamic, that were all a part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, that all are linked into Turkey, are all five southern states in Russia, I believe, are going to be a part of this war. And really, if you start looking at where the ancient tribes are from, it could actually stretch into Persia, which could also stretch into Iran and Pakistan. So in other words, can I, tell you, can I just tell you what the invasion of Gog and Magog is? You ready? It is an Islamic invasion. It is Muslim nations with fanatical leaders coming together thinking they can defeat Israel. Now I want to stop for a moment and, and tell you something. When Israel fought the war in Lebanon, I began to read, in fact, before I even came over here to tape this, there was an article that the president of Iran said that in the war, Hezbollah defeated 50% of the Israeli military and destroyed 50% of Israel. I asked one of my guides how much damage was done with missiles that came in. He said, well, there were 7,000 missiles that came into the northern part of Israel. He said, but really, a lot of them just hit the land and blew up. He said, we had to go look for buildings that were damaged. He said, I took a bunch of people that wanted to go see it after the war, and they said, we well, have to take a left, take a right, take a left, and you'll see a building. Go up here, take a left, and a right, and a left. I said, wait a minute. You mean the whole northern part was not destroyed? He said, absolutely not. And the Iranian president believed and is now telling his people 50% of Israel was destroyed in the war. I don't know what pictures he's looking at, but somebody's deceiving the man. But did you know what God said? I'll make you think an evil thought. Then I'll turn you back and then bring you down. Hello. The evil thought just might be they can destroy Israel. You've got to trust me with something. There's no way these Islamic countries would ever come into this territory and attack Israel unless they thought they could win. And I believe that war in Lebanon was a setup. And that war was to make these people think, you know what, we can do it now. Look at what Hezbollah did. We can do it now. But what they don't understand is when that old bear from the north comes into Israel, he's going to meet the line of Judah. And there's going to be some severe problems take place for them when that happens. But my point is, and I don't want you to miss it, how that these nations that are going to be a part of this battle were all one time pro-Western, and now they're not. And now many of them are absolute enemies of the West, and they hate the West because they feel like that the West helped create Israel. And that's where the, where, uh, the difficulty is of why they believe the way they do. Now, here's the part that's interesting. That's why I'm here. One of the areas where this battle is going to take place, in fact, if you read the book of Ezekiel, here's what you'll discover. You'll discover that this battle is going to take place in two main parts of Israel. The Bible predicts it's going to happen on the mountains of Israel. Now, directly behind me here, you can see the area of what's called the Golan Heights. You can see the Sea of Galilee directly in front of me, the area of Tiberias. Now, now, several years ago, before 1967, a lot of this back in this direction was Syria. This was Israel. And in the 1967 war, the Israelis gained a lot of this territory back. The 1973 Yom, war was the ma Yom Kippur War was the main war where Syria attacked. That's where a lot of the territory to the north was gained, all the way to the border of Lebanon, the border of Syria, which is over in this direction here. Now, let me read to you the prophecy of why I've come here and why I want you to see this firsthand. Here's the prophecy. God says in Ezekiel 39, 18, I will do a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel. You'll eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. Now, the Bashan, where we're at, is the east of the Jordan River. There was a town by the name of Golan back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 4, uh, 43, I believe it is. And so they call this area today the Golan Heights. When you hear the news talk about the Golan Heights, it's talking about this area where I'm standing right here. Now, this area will be, and this is a valley here, but there's mountains all around us, all the way up into Lebanon and Syria. This area will be where a lot of the battle is going to take place. There's a second area. We'll show you this on video. It shall come to pass in that day, I will give unto Gog a place of graves there in Israel in the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. That's the east of the Dead Sea. And it shall stop the noses of the passengers. And, they sh and, and there they shall bury Gog and all his multitude. And again, it talks about burying Gog. See, there's going to be a man 
that's going to be used by this demonic spirit so, so that, that he will die during this war and they shall call it the Valley of Hamangog. Now this area that we're talking about here or the prophets talking about here is another interesting area because where this area is is east of the Dead Sea in what is today the country of Jordan and by the way not far from Mount Seir where the prophecy is given about Mount Seir claiming the two lands. Uh, claiming Israel, trying to take the countries over. Now, when you look at the prophetic scripture, uh, the Avarim mountain range is located in that area. And that when it talks about the Valley of the Passengers, one of the Hebrew words used there deals with this particular mountain range. And so the two areas where the battle will be the most intense will be the Golan Heights, where I'm at now, in the area of the Bashan. The second area will be over near the edge of the country of Jordan. It's right across from Jericho, right across from the Dead Sea area. Uh, there's all kinds of towns now being built at the bottom of that mountain range there in the country of Jordan. That'll be the second area. But there'll be so many people killed in the battle, ladies and gentlemen, to where, it, when you, in fact, you start looking at this and it gets absolutely incredible of what's going to happen. In fact, let me just say, say this to you, that uh, here's the plan of the enemy. The plan of the enemy is to take a spoil, this is all in Ezekiel 38, to turn your hand upon the places now inhabited, to take away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods. The word spool in Hebrew means to strip them or to take booty, to take a substance. The word goods means the money, the riches, and the substance. And I've heard it preached for years. They say, well, you know, I mean, there's books. I've got books in my library right now that say this. You know, the, the reason Russia and the northern enemies will come against Israel is for the wealth of the Dead Sea. Forget that. Let me explain something to you. The Arab nations, including some of these nations like Libya and Persia, that come against Israel have oil money. They got so much money, they don't even know what to do with it. I'm telling the truth. It is not going to be oil in Israel that's going to bring them down. It's not going to be the wealth of the Dead Sea because the Dead Sea is divided down the middle between Jordan and Israel. And it's worth $2 trillion with the minerals and chemicals that are there. But well, listen, what are the... What are the Islamic nation is going to do with bromide and potassium and salt. Why invade Israel for that? And I've heard it preached for years. The wealth of the Dead Sea is going to bring them in. The Bible tells you what's going to bring them in. They want to spoil, but it's a hook in their jaw. Now, let me tell you what's going to bring them in, I believe. What do you do with your jaw? You don't just talk, you eat. And there's going to be a major famine. My father has already seen this by the Holy Spirit. He said, I don't know when it's going to happen. But the, the nations that have attacked Israel, that have mistreated the Jewish people, are going to suffer extremely severe famine. I don't know. We don't know if it's a result of a war they're going to have. The land gets polluted by chemical weapons. Or it's just going to be a natural thing. But when they do, Israel is one of the few countries in this entire part of the world. Now hear me. That has underground water sources that they bring the water out of the ground. And they have farms now down that near the Dead Sea. In fact, the very very area of the Valley of the Passengers in the country of Jordan that we just mentioned where this battle is going to take place. In 1985 when I stood in, on Mount Nebo and looked into Israel there was one green patch. It was Jericho. This was in the month of May. The next year I came back there were more green patches. The next year it was filled and now all along the Jordan River all the way down to the Dead Sea area now there are farms and trees and produce all the way down at, south of the Dead Sea. 52 farms south of the Dead Sea. Here's my point. They're going to need food, and they're going to go to the place where they can get the food. The Valley of Jezreel in Israel, uh, where Armageddon is going to take place, is farmland. That's all it is, is farmland. Israel can feed her entire population, then take 400% of the produce and ship it to Europe in the winter. The Bible said Israel would blossom and fill the world with fruit. And I believe the hook in the jaw is the food that they're going to need. And they're going to say, we've got to take the land and take a spoil out of this land. But I want to tell you something, and you better know this, absolutely know this, that God said, I will send a fire upon Magog. I'm going to smite the weapons out of their hand. And there's going to be great hailstones with overflowing rain. This battle is going to be so intense. So many people are going to die in this battle through the supernatural intervention of God. That here's what the Bible says. They that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shield, the bucklers, the bow, and the arrows, and the, and the hand staffs, the spears. They shall burn them with fire for seven years. Now, the Bible goes on to tell us that when this battle takes place, 
right after it's over, they will sever out men of continual employment passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it. After the end of seven months they shall search. Then it goes on to say this, And the passengers that pass through the land, when any man sees a man's bone, he will set up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Haman God. Now the part that I want to point out to you that's interesting is this, that it's going to take them seven years to get rid of all the weapons that are going to be laying in the land. Now this is going to be a major battle. Now the reason some scholars believe that this happens before the seven year tribulation of prophecy is because it mentions seven years here. Some suggest that that's when the seven year treaty, Daniel 9.27, is signed after this war. Here's why it would be signed. Because the Islamic nations will have taken the greatest defeat they've ever taken. Only one sixth will remain of the entire army that fights against Israel. So they're going to say, we got to make peace. The Jews are going to take over everything if we don't make peace. And so what's going to happen then, they're going to sit down at the table to negotiate for peace. And Israel, I believe, will be forced to disarm a lot of their weapons. The UN, all these other organizations. We Okay, we've got to get rid of the weapons. And while they're getting rid of the weapons, a man called the Antichrist, he won't be known by that name. He'll be a leader. He'll be arming secretly with his arsenal so that after Israel has disarmed for the first 42 months, he will then take his army with his weapons and be able to invade Israel and Israel be unprotected. And I believe that's the scenario of why this war is so important. Several military people told me that if the land is polluted by radiation, or if it's polluted by chemical or biological weapons, you, you would not be able to go into that part of the land. You would let it lay there. And they actually would go, they hire people to do this, to go and see bones sitting on the ground. And they put up a sign. And later on, men will come after seven months to come and take those bones and to do away with those bones. So I'm telling you something. When you talk about weapons of mass destruction, when you talk about nuclear, biological, chemical weapons in this part of the world, that war of Ezekiel 30 and 39 actually indicates, I believe, that this land, part of it at least, is going to be a, a place where some of these weapons are going to be used. But don't miss the main point. It is God Almighty that comes down and stops and intervenes in this war. Why? Because God said, I'm going to magnify my name. I'm going to let the nations know that I am God, and God will be glorified in this battle. Now, we're going to take a brief break here. And I'm coming back with more teaching. And I'm going to be talking about where are Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. And we're going to talk about a number of other things that I really want you to hear. And we're going to climax the video talking about Jerusalem and the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Don't forget, the Bashan is one of those areas where I'm standing, where that big battle is going to take place. We have come from the Golan Heights, one of the territories, one of the areas where the prophets of the Bible predicted that the war of Gog and Magog would have an impact upon the area of Bashan. We've now come into the lower part of Israel. We're in an area called Gideon Springs where one of the great battles of the Old Testament took place where Gideon took 300 of his mighty men and God supernaturally wrought a great victory for him. You see, before Gog and Magog takes place, there will be other wars that will happen involving the nation of Israel. Many of you watched television a while back when you saw the war take place in Lebanon where the Hezbollah sent missiles into northern Israel. Over 7,000 missiles were sent in and Israel had to retaliate bombing over 15,000 buildings in, this, in the country of Lebanon. There will be, I believe, according to Bible prophecy, there will be approximately two cities or two locations in the near future that will be attacked and the Bible speaks about this. One of them most prophecy preachers and scholars have taught on this for years. It's the city of Damascus. The Bible predicts that one day the city of Damascus is going to be utterly destroyed. That prophecy is found in the prophet of Isaiah, the, his mighty book which is an Old Testament uh, book written by this great man of God. Now let's take a look at this very carefully. Isaiah chapter 13 is a prophecy against Babylon. Chapter 15 is a prophecy against Moab. Chapter 17 is a prophecy against Damascus in Syria. Chapter 18 is a prophecy that deals with the land beyond Ethiopia. Chapter 19 is a prophecy that deals with Egypt. And chapter 21 is a burden of the sea that mentions Arabia, which today we would consider to be Saudi Arabia. Now let's take a look at just one of 
these chapters of the, in the book of Isaiah to see what it has to say. If we look at chapter 19, which is the prophecy about Egypt, here's what it talks about. Now, this is the future. Egyptian will fight against Egyptian. They will be given over to a fierce king and lord. The rivers shall dry up. Five cities will speak the language of Canaan, and one should be called the city of destruction. If we look at several of these passages, we understand that Egyptian fighting Egyptian would probably allude to the Sunnis and the Shiites fighting one another the way they're doing in Iraq. It's going to be Egyptian fighting Egyptian. The scripture goes on to say they will be given over to a fierce king and lord. This would allude to prophetically to the Antichrist who will, according to Daniel, take over the country of Egypt. And then we discover that it talks about the rivers are going to dry up. We know that in the tribulation the Euphrates River is going to dry up and it no doubt will affect other rivers of the world such as the Nile River which runs through the land of Egypt. If we look at this passage, it hasn't happened yet. It's something that's going to happen in the future. Likewise, Isaiah 17, which is the prophecy against Damascus, Syria, hasn't happened yet. It's something which is going to happen in the future. Let me read that prophecy to you right now. The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city. It shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Erior are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. Now what's interesting about this prophecy is it specifically mentions that Damascus, which is the capital of Syria, is going to be totally destroyed and cease from being a city. The reason this prophecy is unique is Damascus is the oldest continuing city still existing in the world. It has never been totally annihilated. There was one time I read about in history where the vineyards and the orchards were destroyed, but yet the city was sp uh, spared because it was willing to pay taxes and to pay tribute to some of the nomadic tribes in the surrounding area that were invading it. But if you go through history, the Encyclopedia Britannica says this, among ancient cities of the world, Damascus is perhaps the oldest continuously inhabited. Its name, Dem Demashk in Arabic, derives from Demashka, a word of pre-Semitic origin suggesting that the beginning of Damascus goes back to a time before recorded history. We do know that uh, Abraham's servant Eleazar was Eleazar of Damascus. So Damascus existed all the way back in the time of Abraham. But the prophecy says, the great prophet Isaiah, that the day will come that Damascus would be destroyed. Now, I want to ask you a question. Why do you think Damascus will be destroyed? What will Damascus, Syria do that would enrage someone to totally annihilate that city? Believe it or not, I believe that the key will be the weapons of mass destruction. Now, I want you to listen to me very carefully because I'm going to give you about three different quotes. And I, I want you to guess who these quotes came from. Are you ready? Here's a quote. It is incontestable that on the day I left office, there were unaccounted for stocks of biological and chemical weapons. July 2003. Who said that? Former President Bill Clinton. Listen to this quote. 2003. Saddam has been engaged in the development of weapons of mass destruction technology, which is a threat to the countries in the region, and he has made a, mockracy, a mockery of the weapons inspection process. Guess who said that? Nancy Pelosi. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Well, let's look at this. Let's look at a third quote. Who said this? Speaking of Saddam, quote, He will use those weapons of mass destruction again as he has ten times since, 18, from, since 1983. Who made that statement? The answer? Sandy Berger, the former Clinton security advisor. So here are people that some of them of their particular party today say there were no weapons of mass destruction. The president lied about the weapons. And people predominantly, over 50% of America, believe that the president lied. But let's go a step further. Do you know that after the war broke out, after the United States invaded Iraq, I was in Israel. I took a Holy Land trip uh, several months later. And do you know while I was in Israel, the Israelis that, that had information simply told me we know what happened to the weapons. A, a little bit of that, uh, some of them went up into the Becca Valley and were buried in the ground in Lebanon, but the majority of them went into Syria. And everyone I talked to that had any military connection, it's like they automatically knew where the weapons went. But yet in America, we were saying there are no weapons. There were no weapons. We went into a war and it was a waste of time and money because nothing was there and never was. Well, let me share something with you that I think you'll find very interesting. First of all, there was a Syrian reporter that was dying with cancer that went into France 
to spend his final days. This Syrian reporter was one of the first men to break a news story, for he had a friend in Syrian intelligence who told him uh, where the weapons of mass destruction that Saddam Hussein had sent into Syria were actually buried. Some of them were buried in caves, and they were actually buried in three different locations in Syria, and a Syrian defense minister was paid over $50 million to take those weapons off of Saddam's hand. Well, that was one report that came out, but it died almost as fast as it came out. Then here's this, another interesting story. Ali Ibrahim Al-Takriti, who was the southern regional commander for Saddam Hussein, he dealt with the chemical and biological weapons program, and he defected in 1991, and he told of massive biological and chemical weapons programs that Saddam Hussein had. But perhaps the most interesting story has to do with a man who has written a book called Saddam's Secrets. He is a, a former military general. In fact, he was the second in command air officer of Saddam's Air Force directly under Saddam Hussein, served under him for many years, and he happens to be a Christian man. And this man finally came out with the information of where the weapons of mass destruction went to. Now, according to this man, who, again, was second in command over the Air Force, he was an Air Force officer, and was answered directly to Saddam Hussein, this is what happens to the, happened to the weapons of mass destruction. Six weeks before the war broke out, before the United States and the Allies invaded Iraq, six weeks before, the weapons of mass destruction were moved out of, out of Iraq and into the country of Syria. There was a natural disaster which had happened in Syria, and Saddam, under the guidance of a Russian military expert, said this is the time to move your stuff out of Iraq and move it into another country, and that's what Saddam did. There were two Iraqi airways, Boeing 747 jets, that were, all the seats were taken out, and they were converted into cargo planes. And so it looked like that Saddam was sending a assistance to the Syrians through these flights, which were not military planes, but commercial planes. Therefore, it would never be detected what he was moving. And when the material got into the cargo bins, it was then moved later from there into the different locations of Syria. Now, according to General George Sadis, there were 56 flights of these airlines coming from Iraq into the country of Syria. And in these 56 flights, thought to be civilian flights, therefore they were not detected, Saddam was able to take his weapons of mass destruction and component parts into another country six weeks, or actually began the process six weeks before the war actually began. What is also interesting is there was a cover-up company called SES that actually received those weapons. It was a, it was a company which had been formed. And Saddam did something else that I thought was very intriguing. All of the scientists that knew about biological, chemical weapons and nuclear programs, he told these men to spend time learning all the information and keeping it in their mind. In the year 2002, Saddam destroyed his paper trail of his weapons of mass destruction programs. And this is why when the inspectors went in, they said there's no paperwork, the paperwork has been destroyed, but yet the men who knew how to make these deadly weapons of mass destruction still had the information retained in their head and in their, uh, their knowledge. Now, shortly after 9-11, something happened in the country of Jordan. There was a, uh, the, the, the Jordan intelligence services actually seized, listen to this, 20 tons of chemical weapons that were being trucked into the country of Jordan by Al-Qaeda members who had brought it in from the country of Syria. There was VX, nerve gas, sarin gas, and 70 other chemicals that were a part of this process. Now listen to this. If this truck had gone into Jordan, this was the plan, and had been exploded in front of the Jordanian Intelligence Agency or the U.S. Embassy, the Jordanian officials said that 80,000 people would have died by this chemical and biological attack. The media, oddly enough, said very little about it, but the, this is when uh, General George Sadis and others realized that you know, the Syrian government by themselves did not make some of this stuff that was on the trucks. It was some of Saddam's stockpile. So they were simply going to bring it in on a truck, explode the truck, let a noxious poisonous cloud fill the air over Jordan, and hopefully Al-Qaeda wanted 80,000 people to die. So ladies and gentlemen, let me say something to you. That Damascus could be destroyed. Now this is speculation, but we're trying to think ahead. What if, for example, that terrorists, and there's 10,000 terrorists in Damascus, according to one recent report. What if 
a, a group of terrorists decided to get on the edge and take these chemical and biological weapons, put them in warheads, and shoot them into Israel. Can I tell you something? The Jews were gassed in the gas chambers, and six million Jews died being burnt and gassed to death by the Nazis. They're not going to allow their nation to be destroyed and gassed to death again. I will guarantee you that Israel will retaliate against Damascus with the strongest weapon they have, and it is no secret Israel does have nuclear weapons. Israel will attack Damascus, Syria and totally, completely annihilate it if they ever pull out weapons of mass destruction to totally annihilate the Jewish state. And the people that would do it, I personally don't believe, would be the normal Syrian president or the Syrian leaders. I think they know what would happen if they did it, but I would not put it past an Al-Qaeda group or a terrorist group to somehow be involved with an attack like this and it would cause the Israelis to have to retaliate against Damascus. But ladies and gentlemen, any way you look at it, the prophecy says Damascus one day would be destroyed. Now here's what's odd. There's another strange prophecy. Oh my, I've got to tell you about this. And this prophecy deals with the area of Gaza. Now you know, if you watch the news any length of time, you know that there's an area in Israel called the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is a territory where the ancient Philistines used to live. The ancient Philistines used to live along the coastal lines. Now the Gaza Strip is the border of Egypt in Israel. It is a refugee camp. There are over one million Palestinians that live in that part of the world in this particular refugee camp. And Gaza has always been a thorn in the flesh to the Israeli people, to the Israeli military. And there's a group there called Hamas. And there's a political ring, wing of Hamas. And there's a military wing of Hamas. And these particular people are very heavily involved in being anti-Israeli, very heavily involved in saying that one day they're going to take Israel from the hands of the Jews. One day they are going to control the city of Jerusalem. And so the Hamas, which, whose headquarters in, is in Gaza, these particular individuals, ladies and gentlemen, are very dangerous individuals. The, the military wing is basically a terrorist organization. Now having said that, let me share with you a, a prophecy that's very, very, very interesting. The Bible talks about in Joel chapter 3 and verse 4, it's one place where the word... Philista is mentioned. Now, did you know? Let me say something to you that's very interesting. Did you know that in Joel chapter 3 and verse 4, there's a word mentioned, Palestine is mentioned one time in the Bible. The word now, Philista and Philistia and Palestina is mentioned. But, you know, the Palestinians talk about Israel being Palestine. Now, in the prophecy of Joel, here's what's interesting about the prophecy of Joel. When you begin to read the prophecy of Joel in the Bible, you will discover, well, let me just read it to you. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coast of Philista? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me swiftly and speedily, I'll return your retaliation upon your own head. Now, do you understand that this passage deals with Tyre and Sidon? Do you know where that is? That's Lebanon. Do you know where all the Katusha rockets that were sent by Hezbollah came from? The area of Tyre and Sidon. Do you understand that when Israel bombed those buildings, where they were bombing those buildings at? In Tyre and Sidon. Now, here is a prophecy concerning those two cities that are up in Lebanon, and Hezbollah has a control of that particular area. And then the same prophecy mentions the area of Philista, Philista, or Palestina, or Palestine. And this is what the Arabs, who are non-Jewish people, call the nation of Israel. They don't like to use the name Israel unless they're moderate. They use the name Palestine. And so here is an ancient prophecy in the book of Joel, a last day prophecy that mentions Tyre and Sidon, Lebanon, that's where Hezbollah is, and mentions Palestine or Palestine, and that's the area that uh, the Palestinians call the nation of Israel. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with you is God is saying, are you going to do something? Are you going to cause a battle? Are you going to fight? When you do, God says, I will allow a retaliation to take place. Now here's what begin, when you begin to put the picture together, here's what becomes very interesting. And I want to give you these prophetic scriptures that are found in the Word of God. According to Zephaniah 2 and 4, Gaza shall be forsaken and Eshkelon shall be a desolation. Ze Zephaniah chapter 9 and verse 5, Gaza shall see it sorrowful, the king of Gaza shall perish. Now what's interesting is this, this is a prophecy about the area of Gaza and it, uh, it, it appears that the day is going to come that the entire Gaza 
Gaza area somehow is going to be destroyed. How do I think it could happen? I'm not going to be dogmatic. If men in that area, again, get a hold of weapons of mass destruction, there would be a huge retaliation for the entire area. And thus you would have two major prophecies fulfilled found in the Old Testament. One is the city of Damascus being destroyed and the other is the area of Gaza being destroyed. Now this is not something any of us want. We as Christians love all people. We love the Palestinians, we love the Jews, we love Muslims, we love Buddhists, we love everybody because our, as a Christ, Christian having the Christian faith, we love people. But however, we do understand that the Bible is true. We do understand these prophecies are going to come to pass. So what we're trying to do is help people to understand how these prophecies could take place. I believe that some of these prophecies that we're reading here, we're sharing with you, are going to happen as a result of the weapons of mass destruction that are out there and as they are being used there will be retaliation which would bring major destruction to those who would use those particular weapons now here's a major prophecy from Isaiah chapter 14 verse 29 through verse 32 look at this carefully rejoice not thou whole Palestina because the rod of him that smote thee is broken for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice and his fruit shall be a flying fiery serpent and the firstborn of the poor shall feed and the needy shall lie down in safety and I will kill thy root with famine and shall slay thy remnant howl O gate O city all of Palestina you are dissolved for there shall come from the north a smoke and none shall be alone in his appointed time for what shall one answer the messengers of the nation that the Lord hath found founded Zion and the poor of his people shall trust it. Now ladies and gentlemen this is an absolute amazing prophecy because it talks about that out of uh, the serpent's root and that means out of the serpent's heel will come forth a cockatrice and that's a viper and its fruit shall be a flying fiery serpent. Now let me just simplify that prophecy for you. The conflict that you see happening in Israel today is going to continue to build. Eventually organizations, terrorists organizations are going to get the wrong weapons and feel like they can use them freely. As they use them freely, they will be heavily retaliated against. And as a result of these battles, watch this, before the battle of Gog and Magog, some of these wars that could take place, it's going to lead into a flying fiery serpent. Do you want to know where that's at in the book of Revelation? It's in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3. There appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. The Greek word dracon there is the word for serpent. A great red serpent having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. The point is that the conflict of the wars before for Gog and Magog, I personally believe may actually institute the uh, a destruction in Gaza, a destruction in Damascus, and it will produce the flying fiery serpent. In other words, these wars are going to produce the final battle of the dragon or that great serpent in the heavens, which will go forth, Revelation chapter 12, to destroy the remnant of the Hebrew seed. Read that in the Bible, where the woman is travailing with the man child, and she gives birth, and the dragon comes to destroy the man child and God has to take the remnant and place the remnant of the seed into the mountains and we believe that's probably the area of Petra in Jordan to be protected for a period of 1260 days. Ladies and gentlemen, these old prophecies that you read in the Bible that deal with the last days, we can begin to slowly, I believe, understand how they're going to come to pass. Now we don't know when they're going to come to pass, but we can say that we know they're going to come to pass and we can see the signs and the evidence of how they're going to come to pass. As I conclude this segment of this particular teaching, let me read to you a scripture that I have uh, 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 written down here or I uh, typed out for you that deals with, again, Isaiah 17, the destruction of Damascus. Here's how the nations will react. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas, to the rushing of the nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of mighty waters, but God shall rebuke them and they shall flee afar off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And behold, at eventide trouble and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us and the lot of them that rob us. So in other words, the nations are going to be in a rage. They're going to be enraged as a result of the destruction of Damascus, according to this. And it implies here that at eventide 
trouble comes or at in the evening time is when the when, when this destruction will take place because you see you now fight battles not in the day but you do it at night and you can do things by radar by satellite at night that you couldn't do during the, the, the daytime and I will say to you again it's very possible that the weapons that were taken out of Iraq into Syria that have been hidden will be used by the wrong people and that could initiate that great day of destruction mentioned in the Bible and the Word of God so once again the Gog and Magog is the big battle Armageddon is the climax that's the big battle of battles but before Armageddon is Gog and Magog and I believe before Gog and Magog there will be a series of other battles and skirmishes that will lead to the fulfillment of the scriptures Now we're going to go to another break here and when we come back we have more powerful information to share with you on this special teaching of the prophecies of Ezekiel the great Ezekiel file I've come to the city of Jerusalem where it's all going to end. Actually, the end is only going to be the beginning because it will be from this city that Jesus Christ will rule and reign for 1,000 years. Now, what I want to do right now is do sort of a summary of what we have discussed on this special teaching. If we go back, we, did, we know that there's going to be certain wars that are going to take place in the near future before the battle of Gog and Magog. I believe personally, as I've shared with you, that two cities that are going to be affected will be the city of Damascus based on Isaiah 17 and 1 and the Gaza area based on some of the scriptures that we have already given you. We do not know when these particular battles are going to take place, but we know they will. Then here's what's going to happen. There is then going to be a major war called the War of Gog and Magog, which we've already shared with you. We've shared with you that the majority of those nations that are going to be involved in that battle are Islamic nations that are very much even at this moment against the nation of Israel. I personally feel that after the battle of Gog and Magog is when that major treaty is going to be signed based on Daniel 9 27 a seven-year treaty concerning the land of Israel I've shared with you how I believe that Israel will be disarmed by the United Nations and the other nations saying you can't have these weapons of destruction anymore and yet the Antichrist and his forces will be secretly piling up weapons and in the middle of the tribulation will invade this blessed holy city of Jerusalem the Bible tells us that half the city will go into captivity that's interesting because prior to 1967 and Jerusalem was a divided city. It was divided directly down the middle. Everything you're seeing here, which is the Kidron Valley that comes all the way in front of the Eastern Gate, the Mount of Olives, this was the country of Jordan. Everything in this direction where you see the tall buildings was called West Jerusalem, and that was the Jewish section. So the city before 1967 was a divided city between the Arabs and the Jews or the Jordanians and the Jewish people. After the 67 war, it became united. But we do know that there are forces in Israel that demand to have this city back, most of them being Islamic people. They want the city back. Why do they want it back? Because directly behind me is the third holiest site in all of Islam, the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is directly behind me. And so this city is going to be, according to Zechariah, a cup of trembling to all nations. And God has said, the nations that come against Jerusalem, I'm going to judge. When will that judgment take place? Not the battle of Gog and Magog. That battle is going to take place at what is called the Battle of Armageddon, Revelation 16, 16. And during Armageddon, he gathers all nations together in the Valley of Megiddo. Now let's pick it up from there and see what happens. The return of Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 19, where he comes back on that white horse crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords, where he sets up the kingdom for 1,000 years. That event is important because it comes in three stages. Now I never heard this taught growing up. I've been in church all my life, heard some of the greatest preaching from wonderful men of God and even women that were great Sunday school teachers. But nobody ever taught me that this, this, this coming of the Lord in Revelation 19 would be in three stages. You know, when you read the book of Revelation, you discover that when Jesus comes back, his garment is drenched in blood. I used to think maybe that's his own blood. It's not. The Bible tells us that he goes into Bozra, which is located over near the Dead Sea, and he treads the wine press alone. And then his, his garment is bloody. That's found in the book of Isaiah. And I read that and I said, that's it. Jesus actually by himself 
comes to the earth and defeats the armies of the enemy in Bozrah. Do you know why? That's near Petra. That's where the Jewish remnant will be. Satan will make his final attempt to destroy that remnant and Jesus will come back and fight the Antichrist armies that would attempt to destroy the Jewish remnant. Jesus then returns to heaven and he has, uh, what well, the Bible says it this way, he's riding on a white horse. And on his thigh and his own, upon his vesture is a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he has a garment dipped in blood. This is the picture I get. This, I call it the three stages. Of the, of the return of the Lord. The first stage will be the Judah stage, Zechariah 12, 7 through 9. He shall save the tents of Judah first. Why? Because that's his tribe. That's his territory. That's where he's from. He's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So the Judah territory includes a lot of what you're seeing in this direction all the way into Bethlehem. That is the area of the tribe of Judah where King David and Christ were born. So he's going to come and save a remnant there. Then the Bible says the second stage would be Isaiah 63, 1 through 4, where he shall go to Bozrah. He, the Bible says, I have treaded, treaded the winepress alone, and there is none with me, and my garments are drenched in blood. That's a picture of the Messiah coming back to literally battle with the sword of his mouth, the armies of the Antichrist, and those armies that would be destroying the Jewish remnant in Petra. Then there is the third stage. <laughs> Guess what? The third stage is where you and I come in, because Zechariah 14 says, His feet shall stand that day upon the Mount of Olives. That's where I am right now, which is eastward in Jerusalem. And the mountain shall cleave in two parts, one part to the east and one part to the west. And there'll be a great valley that will separate and water will flow from Jerusalem into the Dead Sea and into the Mediterranean Sea, which is in this direction. So that's the part where we become involved because we will return with him, Revelation 19, on white horses. We are called the armies of heaven. Oh, can't you wait for that day? I'm telling you what an excited. I like to just come here and kind of spot my land out before I come, spot the territory out, see? But watch this. This is very, very, very important. He comes to the Mount of Olives, and that's the third and final stage. Now, you remember reading in the Bible about the blood being up to the horse's bridle. Well, a lot of people say, Brother Stone, what do you think it means? Does that mean that blood is going to be like a liquid blood all the way to the horse's bridle? Where in the ancient time, things could be measured by a horse to the knee of the horse, the hip of the horse, the, the bridle of the horse, or the, to the head of the horse. And I believe that has reference to the bodies that are going to be stacked so high that if you stood a horse beside it, the bodies will actually come all the way up to the horse's bridle. Now, from Megiddo to this valley here, this is called the Kidron Valley, but in the Old Testament, it was also called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And in the book of Joel, it talks about how that God is going to bring the judgment in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, many people believe that the blood to the horse's bridle doesn't necessarily allude to Armageddon. It actually alludes to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, where the Antichrist armies are making their final attempt to seize Jerusalem, make their final attempt to destroy the Jewish remnant, and when the coming of the Lord comes, the Bible said they shall be destroyed with the brightness of His coming and by the sword of His mouth. And literally the bodies of enemies will be piled up. The Bible tells us that the tribulation is to destroy the sinners out of the earth. But Jesus has to come back according to the book of Revelation to save the earth from men that would annihilate it. Weapons of mass destruction, biological, chemical, nuclear weapons. We can see how years from now that could literally happen. Now, when we return to Jerusalem with Christ, I want you to know it's not going to be looking like the perfect picture city that you see here. These walls will be damaged, but the Messiah, according to the Bible, will come through the eastern gate in the book of Ezekiel. Now that eastern gate is sealed. That's very interesting because every other gate in the city of Jerusalem is open. You can go through the Dung Gate. You can go through the St. Stephen's Gate. It's open in this direction. You can go through the Damascus Gate. You can go through the Zion's Gate. This one is closed. Why is it closed? The tradition says that when the Turks rebuilt the city, they heard that the Jewish Messiah would come through the Eastern Gate. So they sealed it up to prevent the Messiah from coming in. However, the Bible said in the book of Ezekiel that this gate is for the prince. The gate has been opened because the prince has gone in it, but the gate is shut and it will be opened again for the prince. If you read that prophecy in Ezekiel, it almost implies that the Messiah has come through the gate, then the gate will be sealed, and then the gate will be open for the Messiah. That's exactly what's going to happen. This is the gate that Jesus rode the donkey through. There used to be a three-tiered ramp coming from this gate to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus rode that donkey into that gate known as the King's Gate. And they were saying Hosanna to the King. He's already been through not that particular gate, but a gate that's under there that was discovered recently is the original gate. But one day, Messiah will come into that gate. If you don't believe this is an important place, the Jewish people are buried facing the Eastern Gate. So when the, their Messiah comes, they follow him in. This is 
is a Muslim cemetery in front of the East Gate. They're buried this way so that when he returns, <laughs> they'll meet him at the resurrection. So you've got two people facing this direction, but I've got news for you. The people that will be there in that resurrection are the people who are born again that have a true experience with the true Messiah who is Jesus Christ. And we will return to rule and reign with him. Now, things are going to change. Trust me, when Messiah comes back, steps foot on the Mount of Olives and takes over this city, everything you're looking at here is going to be totally different. As a matter of fact, I did some research and let me share this with you. Let's look at the changes in Israel. In Israel, the 12 tribes are going to be given, the 12 tribes of Israel are going to be given the land from the, from the Sea of Egypt all the way to Damascus. This is the original boundaries of the Garden of Eden. And then if you keep reading, you will discover that the territory is going to be divided from the Mediterranean Sea, kind of in a, uh, uh, this, this level I hear one tribe will get this upper section, then the next section, then the next section, all the way across. We'll show you a map on the screen to give you an idea of the territory of the tribe. Jerusalem is going to be enlarged. Now listen to this. It's going to be one giant square. The high mountain shall be brought low, and it's going to be a giant square, and there's going to be 12 gates coming into the city, according to the writings of Ezekiel. To the north will be Reuben, Judah, and Levi. To the east, Joseph, Benjamin, and Dan. To the south gate will be Simeon, Issachar, and Zebulon. To the west gate will be Gad, Ash, and Nephtali. Now we're not talking about heaven and the new Jerusalem. We're talking about this Jerusalem that will one day built, be built during the 1,000 year reign of Christ. The outer walls, now imagine this, the outer walls of the city on that day are going to have carvings of palm trees and cherubim. The cherubim will have two faces, the face of a lion and the face of a man. Why? Because Jesus came in the form of a man to be the Messiah, but he's now coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So therefore those carvings, can you imagine this, are going to be all over the wall of the city in the millennial reign. The temple itself, based on Ezekiel chapter 45, this will be the dimensions. There will be a, a platform that will be a mile plateau right on the top here. Now the, city, the, the temple area itself, the whole Jerusalem area, including the temple, will be divided into three sections, 25,000 reeds by 25,000 reeds. Let's break that down for a little bit, okay? In the northern section of the city, when we, when we'll show you this again on a, a chart, in the northern section it'll be 20 miles by 50 miles, and the temple will be a one mile square right in the center and this will be the the area north of there will be the living area for the priest the center of Jerusalem will be 20 miles by 50 miles and that will be reserved for the Levites okay and then when you go to the south it'll be 10 miles by 50 miles and that will be the area where all of the food will be grown for Jerusalem it'll actually be a in fact the food area will be a 10 by 10 area now having said that this is how big Jerusalem is going to be, 50 miles by 50 miles. Now that doesn't sound big, but I'm telling you that is absolutely huge. And so what is going to happen is when Christ returns, he is going to actually rebuild this entire city. You know, th this city is in for a marvelous history. In fact, it, was a, it has had a great history of the past. It's going to have a period of time of tribulation. It's going to be very, very severe. However, at the end of it, many things are going to happen. You know, the Bible even predicts that, that peop uh, Jewish people will go to the Messiah and they will say, where did you get these wounds? And he will say, in the house of my friends. That's a prophecy from the Old Testament prophet. Not only that, but it says that 10 men will take a hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, take us up to the city to learn about your God. Those that survive the tribulation, now think about this, those that survive the tribulation in the future will have to come up to the city of Jerusalem to worship during the Feast of Tabernacles. That's in your Bible. You know, because I preach kind of Hebraic roots and the, the Hebraic roots that in Christianity, every now and then I'll get an email from someone that says, why are you teaching these feasts? It's been done away with, and that's been done away with, and this. And I always remind them, go to the millennial reign of Christ. When they take the hold of a skirt of a Jew, that's the tallit that they're, they're, that's the Jewish prayer shawl that they're wearing. When the Bible talks about celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, that's one of the seven feasts of Israel that is perpetual even in the millennial reign. Did, did you know, reading the book of Ezekiel, there's a priesthood in the, the millennial reign? There are priests and there are Levites. The sons of Zadok are ministering in the temple. I'll give you something to really think about. You ready for this? And this statement caused one of the great reformers to say, the book of Ezekiel should be ripped away from the Bible. 
because he didn't understand what it meant back then. It says that people are going to bring sacrifices up to this temple and offer sacrifices at the temple. Why that can't be, Brother Stone, Jesus is the final sacrifice. Wait a minute. He's the high priest of heaven now, but when he comes back here, he's a king. It's a total different position. And those sacrifices are memorial offerings to celebrate a memorial of all that was done through the acts of redemption. Now, I can't explain everything God does. I can't explain the reason the Lord will permit that, but I'm going to guarantee you one thing. The book of Ezekiel is just as inspired as the book of Revelation. And so there are some things in there that are a little bit mysterious, but nonetheless, it will happen. Now, here's what's interesting. At the end of the thousand-year reign, Satan is loosed. I have people email me sometimes and they'll say, Brother Stone, why does God allow the devil to be loosed from that bottomless pit at the end of the thousand years? The only explanation I can give you is this. Think about this. The saints of God will have resurrected bodies. We're not going to get tired. We'll be able to walk day and night through here. The Bible said the gates of the city will stay open continually for little children will celebrate in the street. If a man dies before he's a hundred years of age, it'll be a strange and an odd thing. But let me show let me share this with you. When you begin to talk about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, when you begin to talk about the things that are going to happen, there's going to be some very, very unique changes that's going to take place here. And so when Jesus Christ comes to set up his kingdom, we find that the Bible talks about the animal sacrifices being established. We find that he talks about, and I believe, again, those are memorial sacrifices, that there will be a healing river that will run from underneath the altar at the temple that will come down and part of the water, it starts out ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, becomes a river river that will come out of Jerusalem and go all the way into the Dead Sea which is located in this direction here and we're up 2,500 feet in elevation the Dead Sea is 1,500 feet below sea level and that water will pour down into the Dead Sea cause the Dead Sea to be healed and the Bible teaches that when the Dead Sea is healed that it will produce fish of many kinds now Gideon who's my guide here we have seen this with our own eyes they are raising fish in the southern part of the Dead Sea and and in in the area of En Gedi the area of, uh, of uh, En Gedi which is uh, right off the coast of the Dead Sea. This is hilarious. Uh, there are going to be fishermen there. There's going to be fishermen that, that's going to have a fishing business. I taught that on TV. I showed people the prophecy. A group from Britain came to Israel, went to En Gedi, and asked them if they could buy a fishing license there. The people said, there are no fish at the Dead Sea. They said, no, but there's going to be. And they're working on the process of opening up a fishing business so when the Lord comes back, they'll be the people that will be selling the nets to the people. Now, that's not a joke. That really has happened. That's how serious people are about the Lord coming back. But when that river in the millennium flows, flows from the Temple Mount platform under the threshold of the altar where Christ sits and goes into the sea, then there'll be trees on either side of the river that will bring healing. Now, that's going to be during the millennium, but if we go to the end of the millennium, we find out Satan's loose. So why does God allow Satan to be loosed? Here's what I believe. The saints of God are going to have a resurrected body. That means we will be free from temptation of Satan. However, there are going to be people born in the millennium. There are going to be people born during the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. Those people have never been tested by Satan, tested by evil spirits, the way we had to be when we lived on earth. You know why? Because Satan is bound. The demonic powers are all bound. Men are worshiping the Lord. So God is going to allow those who survived the tribulation and their descendants to be able one time to be tested by the devil the same way we were. And then it's going to determine whether they're going to be faithful to God or it's going to determine whether they, they turn away from God. And that's why at the end of the thousand year reign, there's a great white throne judgment. And those who die in the tribulation are going to be judged then. And those who survive in the millennium who die, natural men, are going to be judged then. And that's why, now watch this carefully, that those who die in the 1,000 year reign, the Bible says, at the great white throne judgment, at the end of the thousand years, this will, this will happen in heaven, will be judged according to their works. Because they're going to be judged by how they treated people in the thousand years. Did they serve the Lord during those thousand years? Did they present Him 
uh, memorial offerings during that thousand years, it's going to be a little bit different than it is now. So then when that thousand years is completed and the great white throne judgment takes place, the Bible says that God, he renovates the earth with fire. That's in 2 Peter. And then John said, I saw a new Jerusalem and a new heaven and a new earth. The word new there doesn't mean God does away with the old. It means he renews the old. He renews the heavens. He renews the earth. Then the new Jerusalem comes down. There is no more sea. And more than likely, it'll come down somewhere in this area, 1,500 miles high and long and wide. And that beautiful city will come to earth. And then the saints of God will literally rule with Christ forever and ever and ever, free from sickness, pain, death, and the dominion of Satan. So, what is the battle of Armageddon about? What's the battle of Gog and Magog about? Here's the bottom line. Satan has always felt that if he could catch God in a lie, he could literally tell God, you have lied and your word is not true. You see, a rabbi said one time that when God swore to Abraham a covenant and God swore by himself to Abraham that he would be a father of many nations, that if God went back on his word and lied to Abraham, God would destroy his throne in heaven. That's how real his covenant is. Satan has always tried to kill the Hebrew people because those are the people that brought forth the oracles of God, they brought forth the Messiah, and they have the promise for the land. Satan knows if I can annihilate the Hebrew people, I can prove God's covenant a lie, and I will win the universe over by default. And so Satan makes a last attempt through the powers of darkness and through the Antichrist to destroy the Jewish people. Do you understand and realize that of all the people in history, Jesus has more prophecies about him than anybody, but do you know who the second person is? The Antichrist. If you go take the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, Matthew 24, and talk about the end of days and what's going to happen, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Assyrian from Isaiah, you take all those verses about the Antichrist, the only other person outside of Jesus, and I'm talking about that lived on earth, an earthly person, that has more prophecies about them is probably the Antichrist himself if you start in Genesis and go all the way to the book of Revelation. I mean, the whole book of Revelation is about this person coming to earth and what he does and the destruction he attempts. Satan wants to annihilate the Hebrew people, but I come by to tell you it will never happen. They're in the land. They're here to stay. There are some trying times ahead, but in the end, they're going to win. Their Messiah is going to return, and those of you who believe in Him are going to rule and reign with Him. Which leads me to this very important question. You who are watching this, how is your relationship with Jesus? How is your relationship with God? The Bible plainly says this. No man can come to the Father, that's God, except by me. There is no one in recorded history who ever promised to be a Messiah who died to redeem a person and then rose from the dead to seal the plan that he made. If Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, but he raised from the dead, he alone is deserving to be called Messiah, to be called a Savior, and to be called Lord. And someone said, how do you receive him? First of all, you've got to acknowledge you're a sinner. You've got to acknowledge that Adam sinned, and because of Adam, you're under a death penalty. But the way to get out of that death penalty is to believe in Yeshua, to believe He is the Messiah, and it's faith. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my sin. Lord, I was born into this thing, but you've come to take your blood and redeem me from my sin. And I want you to pray that prayer, and I want you to believe with me that the Lord is going to redeem you back to Him and give you access to the heavenly temple one day, give you access to rule and reign with Him on earth for a thousand years, and to be blessed in your life. And if you pray a prayer for Jesus to come in, I want you to write me and let me know so that we can rejoice and celebrate with you. So here's the point. Great things are going to happen. Terrible battles are coming. But I've read the end of the book. And guess what? We win. God bless you. He, from here, in the land of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, where one day we will rule and reign with the king for 1,000 years. I hope you enjoyed that teaching on location in Israel. Now for the next few moments, I want to sum up not only what we have said, but to show you how events taking place right now in Israel and around the Middle East and also all the way over into Afghanistan and Pakistan may have an impact on setting up the War of Gog and Magog. As you know, there uh, has been a conflict taking place, and it seems to be increasing, between what we call Islamic fanaticism and Muslims that are involved in terrorism and the West and Israel. It seems that Muslims, for some reason, not all of them, but the fanatical element, which there may be as many as 200 million 
that fall into that category according to some estimates by those who study this. Those particular individuals seem to have an agenda. Now the question is, where does that agenda come from? Why are they so set on the destruction of Israel and the destruction of the United States of America? And how does that fit into what is going to happen with the War of Gog and Magog? I think the first thing we have to explain before we can actually explain that in detail and answer that question is to go back to the empires of biblical prophecy and show you where they ruled. I have behind me an object lesson. It's the a replica of perhaps what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream in Daniel chapter 2. I'm going to go over this and share with you how this is a picture of the empires of biblical prophecy from the ancient time all the way to the very last day when the Messiah will come back to rule and take control of the earth. When you begin with this metallic image recorded in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 2, he saw a head that was of gold, chest and arms of silver, hips of brass, legs of iron, feet that were a mixture of iron and clay, ten toes a mixture of miry clay and iron. Now what this is a picture of, it's a picture of the empires that would rule from Babylon all the way to the very last day in the time of the Antichrist. We begin with Babylon. The head of gold represents the Babylonian empire under King Nebuchadnezzar recorded in the book of Daniel. We discover that in the middle of the night the Medes and the Persians came to Babylon and overthrew the Babylonian empire and then the kings of the Medes and the Persians ruled from Babylon. Then following that, after a long period of time, there was a man by the name of Alexander the Great from Greece. And Alexander the Great moved his armies in and took over all of the empire of the Medes and the Persians and even expanded his empire into other parts of the world all the way toward India. Then after the time of Alexander the Great, his kingdom was divided with his, uh, between his four generals. And those four generals took over northern Africa. Uh, one of them took over what is called the Seleucid Empire, which is Syria, the area of Iraq and Syria and Lebanon. Another one took over the area of Greece and Macedonia. And a fourth one took over the area of Turkey. So Alexander the Great's kingdom was divided to the four winds, as the book of Daniel indicates. And this is what happened. Well, what eventually took place was there was a development of an empire out of an area called Italy. And that would become the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire became a mighty force, and in the time of Jesus, all the way up to the time of the destruction of the temple in the year 70, the Roman Empire impacted the Hebrew people, the city of Jerusalem, and the Jewish temple. Now, the Roman Empire continues all the way to our present day through what is called the Holy Roman Empire. In fact, Rome was divided between the East and the West. The Western branch was Rome, Italy. The Eastern branch was Constantinople, Turkey. This is actual history. We know that the Turkish Empire ruled from 1517 to 1917. It ruled much of the Middle East all the way toward Armenia, southern Russia, all the way into Arabia. And then at the end of days, we're going to also have an East and the West uh, system set up. And then we're going to have five kings in the east and five kings of the west, making a total of ten kings that will rule at the very end of days. Now, the reason I shared this image with you is because I want to give you what they all had in common. Here's what these, th these kingdoms had in common. Every kingdom listed there, number one, ruled around the Mediterranean Sea area. Number two, they impacted in some form or another the country of Egypt. Sometimes they overthrew Egypt, sometimes they took over Egypt, sometimes they ruled from Egypt. And Egypt, remember, in the Old Testament time was a great empire as far as a territory because it was the entrance to the northern part of Africa. Number three, all of those empires had dealings with Israel. Number four, they had dealings with the Jewish people. Number five, they had dealings in one form or another with the Jewish temple. In fact, Babylon and Rome both destroyed the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and they invaded on the ninth of Av on the Hebrew calendar. So here we have empires that are prophetic empires. Why would the Bible be so concerned about Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome? Because they have dealing with the Jews. They have dealing with the uh, nation of Israel and they have dealings with the Temple Mount where the temple once stood. Now having said that to you, what is there about the last day empire the last day Antichrist empire that's going to one day seize possession of the Mediterranean area, what is there about it that is so intriguing? What is there about it that is so important? Why should we understand it? Because the Antichrist empire, is, ladies and gentlemen, is going to have the same dealings and the same impact that all the previous empires of prophecy have had. Let me explain it to you this way.
When the Antichrist comes to rule, according to the Bible, he will rule from the Mediterranean Sea area, Daniel chapter 7, the Great Sea or the Mediterranean Sea area. Number two, he will have dealings with Egypt. The Bible says he takes over, in Daniel 11, Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia, which is the northern part of Africa. Number three, he invades Israel, just like the Babylonians and the Romans did. Number four, he has dealings with the Jews. In fact, he will attempt to kill and annihilate the Jewish people. Number five, he definitely has dealings with the Temple Mount. According to the Bible, Matthew chapter 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 11, 1 and 2, there'll be some form of a, of a structure built on the Temple Mount where Jewish people one day can go up and worship. But the Antichrist will invade the city, take over that entire area, set up an image of himself and make himself like he is God. So we see that the empire of the future, which is the Antichrist empire, is going to have the same dealings, the same impact on Israel, the Jewish people, and the Temple Mount area that the empires of biblical prophecy in the ancient days had. Now, it's very important to understand that. But it's also important to understand what the Bible teaches about this future empire. You see, the book of Revelation tells us that there is coming a seventh kingdom. Now, in John's day, in the book of Revelation, it says there are, there are seven kings. Five are fallen. Well, we know who those are now. Those are, going back to the beginning of biblical time, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece. There's your five. Then John is told in the book of Revelation by the angel of the Lord, there's a kingdom coming that now is. Now is? Who would that have been? Well, when John wrote the book of Revelation in 95 AD, it's very clear that the Roman Empire was ruling the world. That empire number six ruling in John's day was Rome. And it continues all the way toward the end of days. Now, then the angel of the Lord says, but there's a seventh empire coming after number six, and it will continue for a short space. Many Bible scholars believe, and I tend to agree with them, that that seventh empire that continues a short space is probably the EU, the European Union that is formed, now formed, it is now official, trying to pull Eastern and Western Europe together as one unit. But then the Bible goes on to say in the book of Revelation, but there's an eighth king coming. This eighth king will rule for time, times, and dividing a time, and that's 42 months according to Bible prophecy. Who is the eighth king? He's the Antichrist. Why does he rule for 42 months or time, times, and dividing of time? Because the tribulation is seven years in length, and in the middle of the tribulation, Revelation 13, the Antichrist will invade Israel and Jerusalem, attempting to annihilate the Jewish people. And he'll have 42 months, according to the Bible, to trample down the holy city. Now, since we're talking about the Antichrist and we're talking about this future kingdom, where does this man come to power? Where does he rise up from? Well, I'm here to tell you that the Bible specifically gives you information and tells you where this man will come from and where he will rise up from. And I'd like to give that information to you right now. According to the Bible, according to Scripture, uh, let's, go back to, um, the, let's go back to the image for just a moment and we'll, 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 we'll just tell this in story form. When Alexander the Great, who was a great, great, great war leader, when he came to power, he overthrew, as you know, the Medes and Persians and ruled from Babylon. But he died at about age 33 in Babylon. Now, the book of Daniel identifies him as a leopard with four wings and says the four wings are plucked off of the leopard. We know historically what that means. Alexander the Great was swift like a leopard, took over the entire known world of his day as a young general. He was a great military man. Now, here's what happens. His kingdom, as I said earlier, is divided among his four generals. Basically, here's what happened. One man took the area of northern Africa. One took the area of Syria and Iraq and Lebanon. One took the area of Turkey, and one took the area of Greece. The Bible tells us that out of one of those comes a little horn that will have a mouth speaking great things. Now, having looked at what the Bible says in the book of Daniel, some of the other references, we find something very interesting. This man that we know as the Antichrist is also going to be, according to the Bible, great to the east, to the south, and toward the pleasant land. The scripture is there on your screen where you can identify what we're saying. Now, if we go back to the, this map here, I'm going to show you a little bit about the Antichrist kingdom. And as we said a moment ago, when Alexander the Great ruled from the area of ancient Babylon, let's, we'll get a wide shot of the map here. When he ruled from the ancient territory of Babylon, he actually was in control of everything just about that you're looking at here, all the way into the country of India. Not China, not necessarily uh, to the northern part of Russia, but everything that you see in this area. Now, when his kingdom was split up, 
one general took this area, another general took this area, another general took Turkey and up into this area, and another one took Greece, which is off the map over in this direction. Now, according to the Bible, out of one of these will come the Antichrist. Well, if the Antichrist in Daniel 11 overthrows this area with his army, he doesn't, he doesn't rise from here, but he overthrows this area. We do know that the Bible says in Daniel, the king of the north will push at him. The king of the north then is not going to be Russia. It's going to be this area of Turkey, uh, who is a strong, strong nation in that part of the world, one of the strongest nations. So he doesn't come from there. And then Greece, Greece doesn't have the power of the, of the authority, as it, even in a political sense, to raise up someone to take over this part of the world. But if you, if you, if you know that in the book of, um, in the prophets of the Bible, the scriptures, that the Bible talks about the Antichrist being an Assyrian, we know that this is the territory that the Antichrist is going to be the strongest in. He will be great to the south, great to the pleasant land, which is a name for Israel, and great to the east. Now the east would, would include Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and probably even some of these southern Russian states. Now, if you'll remember on our Gog and Magog teaching, we talked about Iran being the country of Persia, and we talked about how that when you start adding up all the names that are mentioned in the scripture, that all this territory through here could actually be involved in that great battle of Gog and Magog coming into the uh, invading Israel. Now, what does that mean? For that to happen, that means that Iraq and Persia or Iran Syria and Lebanon would have to fall into some kind of a leadership of a person that would actually, because Iran can't, if, if Iran, watch this, if Iran or Persia is going to invade Israel, look at the countries that have to go through. They're not going to go through the south. This is nothing but desert. They would have to come in through the country of Iraq. They would have to come into Damascus. And you have to understand that the Hezbollah here in the country of Lebanon are being financed by the Persians here. And so what I see is this. Iraq, the center part of Iraq is predominantly uh, Sunni Muslim. However, all of this to the south here is Shia Muslim. Every 98% of the Muslims in, in Iran, ancient Persia, are Shia Muslims. So somehow, about half of Syria is now Shia Muslims. Lebanon, most of the Muslims in Lebanon, there's a split between the Sunni and the Shia, but the Shia are becoming strong. I can see where all of this territory in the future could actually be overrun by the Persians all the way over into this direction here. Now that would give them access to bring an army directly into Israel. So the point is that things are going to change from where they are now. The U.S. troops are here, but we're not always going to be here. The U.S. troops are here, but we're not always going to be there. And so I, I believe that as long as we're present there, we can restrain certain things from happening. But once we pull out, it's going to open the door for the fanatics of Persia to take over Iraq. They've already talked about that this is their plan. They want to form a coalition government. So what the Shiites want to do is they want to come in here and take over all this territory. And it makes sense that they would come in and be able to attack Israel in the war of Gog and Magog only after some of these countries fall to the, the branch of Islam that is mentioned here, uh, which is the, I call it the fanatical Shiite branch of Islam. So I think you can see what's taking place here. Now, having said that, I want to share with you why Iran is so active active right now uh, because we could talk about Iraq and we may get into that in just a moment but I want to share with you why the country of Persia which is mentioned in the Ezekiel battle Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 we talked about this on the on the uh, the DVD you're watching the, the battle of Gog and Magog why are they so active here's the reason why because the, the Muslims have what we call apocalyptic beliefs. They have beliefs in the last days and the time of the end just like we do. However, let's go back a little earlier in their history and understand what they believe, why they believe it, and why things are going the way they are right now. If you go back and you begin to study the death of Muhammad, after Muhammad, the founder of Islam, died, the religion split between, between two groups. It split between a group that was called the Sunni and a group called the Shia because there were two different leaders that took over Islam, both claiming to be the heir of the prophet's mantle. Well, what began to happen was this. These two groups began to fight each other. Now, the Sunni branch began to kill the uh, first 11 leaders of the, Sh of the Shiite branch. And uh, the, the one after the other, some said they were poisoned, some said they were beheaded. There's different stories about each one. Now, one of the things that became interesting, and I want to share this with you, is that there was a man by the name of Ali that was killed in Iraq, one of the Shiite leaders in the area of Kufa near Najaf, and later a shrine would be built to him. So the first through the eleventh Shiite leaders were killed by the Sunnis. And this battle went on for quite some time. Now, here's where the story gets interesting. We're going to abbreviate this for you to help you to try to make it as simple as possible. 
In the Islamic religion, the, the tenth and the eleventh leader of the Shiite branch, Ali and a man named Hussein, were killed in the country of Iraq. Both of them were killed in the country of Iraq. Now, both were buried in a certain area, and they erected a golden mosque as a memorial to these men. In fact, the Shiites go every year. They, did, they couldn't do this under Saddam Hussein for like 29 years. He stopped them from doing it. But now that the U.S. troops are there, there were six million Shiite Muslims that went into the city to celebrate uh, the memorial of the death of, uh, of these men that were killed uh, in that area centuries and centuries ago, and you can see that sometimes on the news where they're doing that. So here's where the story gets very interesting, and I want you to follow me carefully. We've got to, we've got to abbreviate this, go through it quickly. The son of the 11th Imam was a young boy that disappeared. They were afraid that the other groups of Muslims, the Sunni Muslims, were going to kill him, so they, he escaped in a well. Some say he's hiding in a cave, but he escaped in a well in this major city. And the cities that, uh, that are the, really the most prominent for this belief are the city of Samarra, Iraq, and you've got the area of Karbala, both which are constantly in the news. And so the twelfth one disappeared. So eventually, after the death of Muhammad and after the death of some of these imams, there was a teaching called the Oculation. It goes something like this. That at the end of days, now this is not in the Quran, this will be in the Hadith and this will be in Islamic tradition. At the end of days, now this is the Shiite, let me go back to the map so, so you can see where this is coming from. This teaching originates very heavily in Iran where over 98% of the population is Shiite Muslim. Then you've got 60% in Iraq that would agree with them. That there is coming in the end of days a, a, someone called the, Mah, the Mahdi, or we say the Mahdi. When the Mahdi comes to power, he will initiate a time of peace and a time of Islamic justice. According to some Muslims, are you ready for this? He will rule the world for seven years. He will appear on a white horse. He'll be riding a white horse when he appears. And eventually what he will do is he will go into Jerusalem and he will convert the Jews and Christians to Islam. And anyone that does not convert is beheaded. Now in Revelation chapter 20, we know that there is a beheading of people who will not reject uh, the testimony of Jesus Christ. We also know that in Revelation chapter 6, we see a rider coming on a white horse at the beginning of the tribulation period. So these things that the Muslims are expecting seem to fit very clearly with the warnings John gave in the Bible concerning a man called the Antichrist. Now here's where the story picks up and I want to share this with you. Uh, there are some of the signs that the Mahdi will come to power. Now the, 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 and this can change overnight, this could change in, in no time, but you know there, are, there is a leader in the country of Persia, in the country of Iran, who has called for the destruction of Israel and the destruction of America. Now he only has a certain amount of time to rule and he's already beginning to lose power, but if this man could do what he wants to do, he has said that the Mahdi has appeared to him in a dream and told him to prepare the country of, of Iran for his arrival and for his appearance. And this particular man is very apocalyptic in nature. And so he feels like there has to be a destruction of Israel and the United States in order for the Mahdi to be able to take control and to take power. Now here's what you've got to understand. People are always saying, why don't we just pull our troops out? You know, they don't want us there. Well, here's the question. Why don't some of the Muslims want us there? If you understand the teaching of the Mahdi, you'll understand why. Because the Mahdi is supposed to be like a theocracy. He is he is supposed to hear the voice of God directly and be raised up by God directly. Nobody voting him in. Nobody asking him to take power. If democracy works in Iraq, I want everybody to hear this. If democracy works in Iraq where a democracy government is set up and all the people have the right to vote, then the Mahdi will never be able to, to, to fulfill the, the expectations of the Shiite Muslims and take over the country of Iraq as long as democracy is working. So as long as our troops are there, and we're not there for this reason, but this is an interesting point, as long as our troops are here, it hinders the Iranian version of the Mahdi taking uh, possession of Iraq. And here's the reason why. Because the Persians in Iran believe that the Mahdi is supposed to raise up out of the territory of Iraq. This is where it gets real interesting here. So when the Mahdi comes, he's going to sweep all this territory under his control. He's going to raise up a huge army. He's going to come in and, and destroy the country of Israel and, and the infidels. Now, What's interesting is, right before the war broke out, I had dinner with a, a gentleman that's in the military, and he began to share this with me. Uh, th he said, do you know there's a man named Muqtadr al-Sadr that is in the country of Iraq raising up 
what he calls the muck, the army. I said, what in the world is, is this guy doing? He said, well, he's got 500 students, seminary students that are with him now, but he claims he's going to raise up the Mahdi army. This man, who's, whose name is Muqtadr al-Sadr, has moved from 500 seminary students to the latest figure, 60,000 men of the Mahdi army. Now, why would he do that? Well, I personally believe al-Sadr is trying to set himself up as the Mahdi because he wears the black banner on his head and there is a hadith that says, and the hadith, of course, is a writing in an Islamic book that allegedly is a statement that Muhammad made. Here's what it says. When you see the black banners coming from uh, Kurishan, then go to them even if it means crawling over the snow. The deputy of Allah, the Mahdi, will be among them. It is also reported that Muhammad said the black banners will come from the east and their hearts will be as firm as iron. So in other words, when you see the Shiite Muslims wearing the black turbans. They have set themselves up to be the guardians of the Mahdi and the guardians of this man's uh, kingdom, which he's going to form at the end of days. Now, what is interesting is here is one of the statements about what will happen when the Mahdi comes. You ready? There will be a great war breakout between the East and the West. There will be st strong fighting. Very many people will be killed. Then the Lord will command Al-Mahdi Al-Hayy uh, Al-Salam to appear. He is in a cave, in a big deep cave. No one can approach it. Jinns or genies, they, that would be spirits, are protecting and guarding him. So, isn't that interesting? Now, I'll tell you, the man who, who, who always tried to set himself up as the Mahdi, according to the men at Gitmo Bay, was Bin Laden. He would even uh, write on a blackboard, the awaited one, and tried to set himself up. And that's one reason he hides in the cave, because he thinks he's going to one day emerge from this cave and everybody's going to accept him. Now, let's go back to some of the things that are happening here, because I don't want to leave anything out. I want you to understand what we're saying here. The conflict in Iraq is, is spiritually about demonic powers that are moving in this part of the world. Politically, it's about liberating a, a group of people from a dictator, but prophetically, it's a prophetic battle. Now, here's what's very, very, very interesting, and I want you to, I want you to pay for careful attention to what I'm going to say here. That the 12th, the 12th uh, we call him, they call him the 12th Imam, who was the son of the 11th, who disappeared, the, uh, the Persians, and I'm going to say Persia, the Persians believe that he will appear in Iraq and he will come out of this well and when he comes out that they have to have the army ready for him to uh, take this army and to be able to come to power. So as long again as American troops are here, it's hindering this concept and this theory of this Mahdi coming to power. But watch how the battle's taking place in Iraq between the Sunnis and the Shias. There was a, there was a mosque that was built which was called the Gold Dome Mosque, all right? Now this mosque was built in 944, the gold was put on it in 1904, and it's where the 10th and the 11th Imams were buried that were killed by the Sunni Muslims. It's a Shiite mosque. Now here's what happened. In the city of Samaria, Iraq, February 22nd, 2006, bombs were blown off at the gold, uh, went off at the Gold Dome Mosque, which is adjacent to the mosque where the 12th Imam is supposed to appear, and uh, it, it completely blew the, the roof off the mosque and destroyed it. Now why would why would a group of Sunnis dress up like policemen and go into a Shiite mosque and blow it up? Because they don't want the Mahdi of the Shiite branch to appear in this area. So they tried to blow up the mosque where he's going to appear. Then the, the Shiites, on the other hand, went into another city where the... Where the uh, Sunni Muslims believe the Mahdi is going to appear, and they blew up a mosque. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is the, the Muslims have apocalyptic teaching. Listen to this. They, they call it the day of uprising, the day of separation, the day of reckoning, the day of awakening and sending forth, the last day, the encompassing day, the hour. They have all sorts of prophecies concerning what they believe is going to happen. One of their big prophecies is that the big powers between the East and West are going to fight each other, and the East is going to uh, win, and the the West is going to be destroyed. Here are some of the signs of the last days. Let me just read these to you. The Syrian army will attack him, but will be defeated and destroyed in the desert. When this happens, both Iran and Syria will unite to pledge their allegiance to the Mahdi. Did you hear what it said? That's a belief that in Syria and Iran, the Persians, are going to unite. Um, he will take Turkey through force. This is the Mahdi. After uniting all of Islam, he will take over the entire world in the name of Islam. Mohammed predicted the conquest of Spain, which some believe will occur under the Mahdi. Number four, under the Mahdi his leadership, there'll be great prosperity, including gold, silver, for his faithful followers. The book of Daniel even mentions that. He will be over the treasures of Egypt and over the gold and the silver. It's very interesting. Number five, after this is accomplished, the Mahdi will rule for five 
Seven, how long is the tribulation? Seven years in length or nine years, depending on which tradition you follow. And then the end of the world will come, followed by the judgment of Allah. Now, my point is, if you compare these signs to what the Bible says, uh, it's very interesting because ac according to them, the Mahdi will unite the Muslim world and the Antichrist will, be, will bring ten kings together under his subjection, Revelation 17, 12. The Mahdi will bring gold and silver to his followers. Daniel said he will honor his God with gold and silver, Daniel eleven thirty-eight. The Mahdi will rule for seven years. The tribulation is seven years in length, Daniel 9, 27. Uh, it says he will take over Turkey. The Bible says in Daniel 11, 40, the king of the north will push at him. Syria and Iraq will submit to the Mahdi. Uh, you know, you, you look at all of these. What I'm saying is if you look at the expectations of these Muslims concerning the Mahdi, then all the biblical warnings about a man called the Antichrist fit the description of what they're expecting. Now, they don't call the Mahdi the Antichrist. They have something called Adajal that they believe is going to be like an Antichrist that's going to appear before the Mahdi does. So the point is that everything that's taking place right now uh, seems to be pointing us to uh, what will eventually come, uh, what will eventually take place with the war of Gog and Magog. Now, uh, one thing that's taking place, and this is very important that you understand this, that the country of Iran, let's go back here because this is the main country mentioned in the invasion of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Again, Shiite Muslim, Shiites here, 50% Shiite in Syria, Hezbollah connected to the Shiite. Can you see how the Shiite Muslim group is trying to take over this part of the world? So what I suspect is this, after the U.S. pulls out, which we will do that eventually, of Afghanistan and Iraq, we're going to see things happening. Now, Iran, there could be a, an attack on Iran because of its nuclear program by Israel and by the United States, which, are, which will, which will uh, uh, trigger this entire area into a battle or will cause uh, Persia to s capitulate for a short period of time. But the point I'm making is this, and I hope coming on and just sharing these things with you has helped give you a better understanding. My point is simply this, that everything that's happening right now with the wars in the Middle East, everything that's happening right now with Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran, all of this is not Gog and Magog. It is a preview to setting it up. And I, that's, what I, that's the point I want to make. The nations are aligning themselves. Those nations mentioned there in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, Iran used to be a, 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 a monarchy. It used to be pro-Western. Libya, same way, used to be pro-Western. And we're not saying that they can't go through a season of democracy where we go back to the iron and the clay. I believe that iron could be Islam and the clay could be democracy, but it doesn't mix according to the book of Daniel. So my point is that we're really living in those times where if the world, those in the world who are not saved, it's very frightening for them. Those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ have been born again that know the Bible, we have nothing to fear, but it's exciting to watch. And what we should be praying for is this. We should be praying that for all the people that live in this part of the world, have the opportunity to hear the prophetic message, have the opportunity to hear the message of Christ, and have the opportunity to, to at least hear it so that they can ask the Lord to come into their heart and life. And I encourage believers everywhere not only to pray for our troops, but pray, to pray for the people who live in this part of the world, that they will come to this wonderful grace and knowledge of the Prince of Peace and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Well, I felt like it would tie together for you some of the things taking place today and how it's going to fit into the scenarios in the future. Whatever happens, I can see this and I think you can too. In order for Iran to be able to move into this territory here, there has to be something take place where they become eventually, eventually strong. The Shiite branch of Islam becomes strong in this part of the world. And I know that is a plan. That's what they're wanting. And time will tell how it's going to take place and how long it will take. But an attack on Iran from the West could trigger uh, uh, negative repercussions in this whole part of the world here that we have never not seen before. We need to be in prayer. We need to study the prophetic word. We need to be aware of what's happening in these last days. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. And if you know someone that would be blessed by this teaching, uh, you can contact our office, go to our website at perrystone.org. You can always order on our, through our online bookstore, and uh, we have a magazine that we make available to people. You can get information on that, our Israel tours that we go to, and we're going we're to keep going to Israel till the Lord comes back, God willing. We love the country. We love to take people there. We love to share with them, and also many of our conferences that are coming up. We'd love to have you be a part of that. Thank you for your time, and again, I hope this has been a blessing. I know it's been a lot. Play it over and over again to get the meat of God's word for your life. Thank you, and God bless you is my prayer.